Hello, everybody. My name is Ian Kirk Pattycake. I'm an author and robot, and today I wanted to talk about implementation of trauma, or rather, post-trauma in some sort of way. I don't know. Um, just trauma, because I've been thinking about this, and we're going to talk about this in a very, like, colloquial and experience and somewhat psychological sense, and in no way is this a cover-all for everything or there's only one way, but if you've been hanging around my channel very much, I kind of just like to present conversations on different topics that I think about or that I write about and then get conversations going in the, the, the comments because you guys have some really interesting insight and I love seeing the conversation that comes out of these sorts of topics. But before we get started, number one, if you enjoy what I do on this channel, please remember to like, share, and subscribe for more. Number two, if you would like to be featured on this channel, check out the two links in the description below, Lemoy and Fresh Meat Feature are how you get here. And then number three, if you're interested in checking out any of the books that I have written, they should be linked in the description below. So I spend a lot of time reading psychology nonfiction and specifically true crime nonfiction and profiling nonfiction and all sorts of things that have to do with recognizing trauma or reading through the stories of people's lives who went through something traumatic. And one of the things that was specifically brought up in one of the books I read recently, um, Whoever Fights Monsters, didn't I read that this year? I see I forgot about that one. Uh, Whoever Fights Monsters, which is by Robert Ressler, who was one of the founding members of the behavioral unit in the FBI. And one of the chapters is very specifically about trauma triggers. So one of the things that you tend to notice if you study serial killers or really criminal criminals in general, because I also... Because I also watch a lot of like true crime videos that go over the entire, as far as biography as people can go. And it relates to the trauma trigger because the trauma trigger is like that one event that breaks the camel's back and basically changes the trajectory of a person's life. In my opinion, and this is totally as like a layman <laughs> and as just a theorist and a writer of sorts. From my understanding, you've got when you have that major shift into the criminality specifically, but it can do it in a bunch of different ways, uh, to self-destructiveness, whatever. It happens because of just this event after event after event is changing like your reactions inside and interacting with your personality inside of your head. But it's this one major event that basically switches the chemicals in your head and basically changes who you are. So one of the things that I've come to believe personally, and this is a generalization, so it's not true for literally everybody, but I think I've noticed a pattern that when a male goes through a trauma, when their trauma trigger goes off, they tend to become destructive. As, However, when a female tends to have their trauma trigger go off, they tend to become destructive. And what I mean by that is external expression versus internal exp expression of the trauma. So like with myself, Oh, and trauma is so much, so much wider in spectrum of what it can be that flicks that switch than I think can, is generally understood. Um, I'm going to give some examples of nonfiction and then of fiction as well for what I mean. So if you look at the, st the story of Jeffrey Dahmer, obviously, obviously I'm going to bring up Jeff. <laughs> he had surgery when he was very, very young, a very invasive, very frightening surgery when he was very, very young. His house was very turbulent with his mother being... Um, emotionally unstable and emotionally distant and his dad being gone generally because he was working very hard. He also tended to have no real connections with his classmates and may have been picked on or bullied in ways where he tried to then overcompensate, you know, by making jokes out of himself that would then get them to laugh at him because then he wouldn't be alone. M ultimately, my opinion is the trauma trigger for him was when his mother moved out after the divorce was stated. So divorce is such an understated trauma for children. And that is not an area where you will ever be able to change my mind because divorce for children specifically is so damaging to have parents separated, to have parents reject each other. And it can get so much worse depending on how it happens. Now it can make it worse if they're younger and it can still have effects when people are older. But I, in general, think that divorce is very, very destructive on the family, and it is a trauma trigger for people that are involved. Now, that does not mean that everybody who is involved in in a divorce, like all children, will become a bad or anything, but it does create a traumatic event for an individual, and some are able to recover and some are not. But there are even stories in people that go on to live normal lives, but emotionally they have said that they could not recover or never fully recovered from 
the divorce of their parents. And so, again, the, the trauma response that anybody has varies depending on your personality, your personal chemical composition, and all of the experiences you had in your life that build up to this thing that triggers the trauma. So with Jeff, I think the trauma event was for him was his parents' separation and where he was abandoned at his house. I think this is super easy to recognize, especially because his entire MO, if you study all of his crimes, is the fear of loneliness and alienation, and the fact that it was shortly after he was abandoned by his mother during the time after he graduated high school that his first death happened, or that his first murder happened. And that's one of the things that Robert Ressler talks about in his book is this extremely stressful event that causes a traumatic response inside of the individual. It triggers a traumatic response inside of the individual and it's usually is preceded by a criminal's first crime or escalation in crime, I should say, to something like murder. Um, if I was smart, I would have grabbed the book and like looked for the spot where he was talking about this in there, but it happens. If I go to another example is Paris Bennett, which I recently heard about. He was the only, first he was the only child of somebody who was drug addicted until she ended up getting off drugs when she became pregnant or shortly before she became pregnant. And they were very, very close. He was born a genius with 141 IQ, I think it was. And it was just the two of them for a while. He didn't have a father until she got pregnant from another man and then she had a he, he and then she had a little girl the three of them were considered to be very very close but it was when paris was 11 that his mother relapsed on drugs and when he was 13 he would then stab and murder his little sister and he would say that it was because he felt betrayed by his mother having a drug relapse because he trusted her and that felt like a betrayal of his trust and a betrayal of him and he wanted to hurt her that's what he claimed now he is considered a psychopath so what can you trust about him but I think of all the things that he said you can probably trust that as his motive not only was he betrayed through her taking the drugs but then they ended up living with her mother which was a very turbulent time and moving around which threw him into more of that stressful situation following the initial trauma trigger like none of it helps um then you have with ted bundy i cannot specifically remember the timeline i cannot specifically remember if he found out that his sister was his mother or if he was dumped first but i think his trauma trigger was discovering that his mother had lied to him this whole time because that was when he was in college and he went off to the place where he was born to try to look for who his father was because he wanted to know who his father was. And he eventually found out that his the woman who had pretending to be his sister all these 20 something years was actually his mother and she never actually came clean. And I think lying to your kid to that extent that it, it messes when one, even from a young age, it messes with their sense of identity because you're lying about who they are and, and who you are. But it destroys their sense of reality as well because you have just built their entire life on this lie. So what is trustworthy? And then I think that was the trauma trigger. And then it moved into his targeting people um, that looked like his ex-girlfriend who dumped him and that whole motivating factor there. Now that could be wrong. I have to double check on the timeline of all of his things, but that is where my theory is for him. So we see all of these trauma triggers preceding an escalation to behavior that then kind of influences who they are. And I think it's even more obvious when you look at Ted Bundy that his trauma trigger was identity related because of how he would change his appearance so well. I think he had an identity crisis. And again, we are just like theorizing here and putting logic and reason together to sort of build an understanding of how this stuff happens or how somebody personally justifies things. And why does this matter? Because we typically use trauma in books and novel writing and as character things. And it's important to know for any character, whether they're a big character, a little character, an antagonist or protagonist, there's always a reason behind what it is they're doing. There's always something that triggered that person into the action or the mindset in which they're at. And that mindset may not actually at all be rational. It may not be irrational, but it is logical. So the answer to being lonely is making a boyfriend that can't leave you because you're, you, you, you're afraid of being alone. Now, it's not rational to say kill them so they can't go and then sleep with the bodies and then get with the ghosts. But if you, that's not rational, but it is a logical step because you 
in your logic brain, you're saying this counts as a person. And so this counts as keeping them around. And so when we're building characters, whether we're putting somebody through trauma or we're going to the post of trauma, we need to follow what is it that twists these characters into believing the ways that they do. And so if you look at a lot of my work that includes trauma, I do a lot that is post-trauma. I don't necessarily focus on putting characters through trauma. And one example of that, I know Dead End Drive kind of has all of it because obviously Kelly is being traumatized as it is, but then you've got so many adult characters who are expressing the trauma that they went through in many different ways and trauma is in many different senses so they're all criminal and and but they're they're all criminally bad but they're not all the same level i would just say that astra is kind of a regular bad person but you've got gavin who is basically a psychopath and he was one born with a mental deficiency going on that already made him less emotive but his father was an alcoholic and oof, he was abusive and um the thing that gavin always abused animals and the thing that took him to the next level was when his father tried to kill kelly and he ended up killing his father. Gavin ended up killing his father. That was the first time that he'd taken human life. Um, and he didn't feel anything from it. Like, it wasn't a big deal. It was just like, oh, here's this thing. And then he had to go to Bertrand to get help because Bertrand was the only person that he trusted at the time. But that was the traumatic event that switched him. But that wasn't the only traumatic thing to ever happen to him because he dealt with his father's abuse for whatever that was, 14, 15 years. The way that Agatha behaves or expresses her behavior in the couple of spots where she is in um, the book shows her response to the callousness of the murder and the human life, the, the degradation of and disrespect of human life during her time at the will reading. Like she continuously brought men back to her house whom she knew were selfish bastards, whom she knew were going to be murdered by her boyfriend Gardner because she was callous of them. She was over it. She had the trauma left over from the way that she was treated and it was kind of a good riddance. So I'm not doing a totally great job at explaining all this stuff because there are so many things that just interconnect and kind of seeing it in line is different than having than saying it out loud. Another thing that I really, it's the reason that I really wanted to write the Dead End Drive prequel, The Benedict Estate, is that because of the trauma that Agatha went through during the will reading, she has this separation. And there was always violence in the Benedict house because that's just what happens. It amplifies the characteristics. Now, her father wasn't abusive in any way. It's just you attract a bunch of bad people. It just happens when you have that kind of money. And at the end of the Benedict estate, you've got Ellie and Anna who are now young women. And Agatha comes home from the, the nearby town and she gets out of the car and she has a little four-year-old Kelly and Bertrand is like you can't have that here do you know what you know what happens to people here and she just looks at him and says ah and and basically implies that she wants to keep this child because she wants a chance to be a successful mother because the traumas that she went through um with the house and in dealing with her two daughters over the last 20 years, she knows that she's failed Anna. She's knows, she knows that she's failed Ellie, who has had so much plastic surgery, even though she's only 18. And that she knows that her daughter Ellie has had sex with all of these older men that ended up dying anyway. She feels like she's messed up as a mother and she just wants another chance. And that Kelly is her chance. But she also knows that she's basically dooming him, just like she has doomed every other man that she's brought into the house, but she can't help it. She's desperate to be a loving mother. She's desperate to have a success. She just can't connect on the way that she needs to, but she wants to try again to do it. And so you see that in the personality development of her after her traumas. With Joey and Bleed More, Body More, you have the development of her hard outer, outer coat because 
of the trauma with her father because of the abuse with her father and her father's suicide and her mother's abandonment. And so she builds up this shell around herself to not only protect herself from getting close to other people, but from also putting other people in danger by getting close to her because she recognizes or she associates herself walking out the door, leaving her father as the thing that kills him. And she doesn't want to do that to anybody else. So she has built from this trauma, this armor, to stop her from getting close to anybody else. And really, she she thinks that she's not hurting anybody else, but she ends up hurting other people. And that's something that she end up she has to deal with eventually. Um, a couple other characters that I have, you've got over here, you can only see half of his head. That is Jarek Cummings. And he is in a <laughs> A not fully, not totally developed story yet. It's one that I'm working on with my creative partner. And he becomes a male prostitute at like 17 after being sexually abused by his single mother's boyfriends, revolving door of boyfriends. His mother has borderline personality disorder. And a couple of times she actually tried to kill him because she felt so bad about the conditions in which they were living, about her, his being abused. And she just felt so sorry that she was such a bad mother that he shouldn't have to deal with this. And she tried to kill him. She tried to drown him in a bathtub. She tried to strangle him a couple of times. And in one of those times when he was 16 or 17, he actually had his trigger, his trauma trigger go off. And I didn't, I wasn't calling it. I don't try to do this. It just makes sense. And now I'm analyzing it in post. And one of those times when he was attacked, he responded by killing her. And then he was just so disassociated. He chopped her up into pieces, put her into bags, disposed of the bodies. And then he ran away from the crime scene because he's a stupid 16, 17 year old kid, didn't know what else to do and just totally disassociated from the situation. Now, because of all the sexual abuse he's had as a kid, he's already had a disassociation as a defense mechanism, a coping mechanism, because that's often what happened when he was um, a kid being sexually abused. Another way that he dealt with the traumas of his childhood sexual abuse is that he started thinking of himself as the sexual predator because he was saying to himself that as a kid, he had all of the power because if he told anybody what these adults were doing to him, then he could get them in trouble. So then he would end up trading sex for things because he's like, I have the power. So that then turns him from being a victim into being in control. And that was just another way in which he tried to cope with the bad things that happened to him. Then the whole story itself with Jarek and um, Seth, these two, these two guys right here, is basically actually having to confront the issues that they've run away from because Seth has run away from his own traumatic past and problems. And um, they're both hiding from that stuff. And then of course there are my twins, Foster and Parker uh, Reed, who are another, they're another story that I'm working on with my creative partner. And after being sexually abused as 10 to 13 year olds by their uncle, um, they are sent off to boarding school where they are forced to deal with their their post trauma on their own. They were sexually abused together, and so they are very close. Already, they're very close because they're twins. But being abused together also made them very close, and also it perverted their relationship. And so you've got the very inappropriate relationship between the two of them, but you've also got the mutation of how they relate to other people and how they relate to their own sexualities. So Parker ends up being hyposexual, which which is sexually repulsed. He doesn't have an interest or a drive in being with other people, even though he will be with Foster, because that relationship is totally different than an actual sexual relationship, even if it's a sexual relationship with his brother, completely different. Then you've got Foster, who became sexually addicted, hypersexual. He is constantly, it is a need that he has to feel like a hit of a drug. And it gets him into some very dangerous situations because he cannot resist that need. And it also, he is a, a people pleaser, which kind of makes it worse with that whole pairing. So the, the aftermath of trauma should always make sense with the logic of the character. This is just a long way of ranting about how the aftermath of a trauma should always make sense with the personality of the character. The The way that they deal with the traumas are not always the same, as you can see with like, not everybody who goes through divorce gets abandonment issues. Not everybody who realizes they were lied to by their parents becomes a serial killer. But 
there it depends on everything else in that character's life and how they've built their values and where those values come from and what it is in their life that they are responding to so even with my own life when my father abandoned us and left there was a lot of trauma i could i'm not, i'm going to try to not be super personal because i don't want to talk about other people's things but i could tell you all like a very different ways in which all of my siblings and i responded to the trauma that was my father's leaving and my father was not even coded about it he was told that hey if you leave your children have these statistics of being damaged in these ways this level of promiscuity this level of doing drugs this possibility of dropping out of school, the possibility for mental illness um, development goes up in all of these ways. And he was warned about all of this. And he said, I don't really care. Screw you guys, I guess. And that really messes with you. And so my the way that I responded to that situation and the way that I developed was very, very different than the way that my sister developed and the way that my brothers developed because we all had our predispositions to what was important to the situation, what our personalities were, and how we tried to solve problems. Now, I saw both of my bro older brothers falling apart and my mother falling apart. And so one of the things that was in my head all of the time was I have got to be the leader of the family because nobody else is doing it. My father is a failure of the man to the family. My older brothers are are not taking up the position. And so then it has to fall on to me. And I was already kind of um, emotionally aloof. I wasn't as emotionally aloof, but it is when the emotional detachment really kicked off. I actually remember being kind of teased by my own family for being emotionally distant at the time and I was looking at other figures um, in media who were emotionally stoic to be like that's what I need to be like because I need to be the rock in the family because nobody else is or can and I took that to an extreme in the ways that I tried to cope with the situation um, in other ways the emotional distance like you can't you can only control it so much but I started to shut down and I was separate and I was already, you know, generally already separated from people. When I went to church as a young kid, I really didn't bond with anybody. Um, I kept to myself already. So I was already fairly isolated. But like I said, the trauma will exacerbate issues that are already within you. Like my brother, one of my brothers is bipolar and his bipolar just shot off on like how bad it instantly got. It wasn't able to be controlled um, in the way that it was before the divorce. And so issues that already existed exa are exacerbated when the trauma hits. And your logic, internal logic, whether it's rational or not, is going to guide your decisions and how you move forward, whether it's destructive or not self-destructive. I guess that also goes back to the sta statement I said before, we're internally destructive versus externally destructive. And again, that's just a generalization. I'm not saying men can't be internally destructive and women can't be externally destructive. But if you think about boys that come from broken homes and that go through traumas, it's usually boys that become school shooters. It's usually men that become serial killers. Not that there aren't women serial killers because there definitely are. It's just a smaller number of them. And so, Generally, if I can look, if I look at the reactions within even my own life and circle, and again, anecdotal, so take that as you will. But when we're writing stories, we're talking basically about anecdotes because it's individual lives. Um, girls tend to punish themselves or do things themselves or take things upon themselves, whereas boys lash out. And that's just a generalization. Again, this is just a conversation. This is just to get like a conversation starter started sort of among the comments on all of the stuff because I do get insight from you guys when I'm thinking about these things. And so, yeah. Trauma is a hot topic in creative writing and it's like whether you write it correctly or not. But I think more importantly than just analyzing how trauma comes out in writing is how do we come to the answers that we do when it appears in writing? And I think one of the best ways that we can learn how to write accurate trauma specifically to the character, because when we're writing trauma in a story, we're generally not writing somebody else's trauma and trying to emulate somebody else's life. We are internalizing it into this character that we are creating and then building it into this person. It's their life. Even the story that I have 
that is inspired by Jeffrey Dahmer or the other story that I have where a character has some elements of Carl Panzram's life in his background. I'm still fictionalizing it and I still have to justify it in his life to make these decisions make sense. And so I think the best way that we can do that is one, show true empathy, even for people that we don't understand or don't necessarily like or are just completely despicably evil. You still have to have some level of understanding that that is a person and they are making decisions that somehow make sense to them. Even if their decisions are like Matthias from Dead and Drive or like the Joker, where it goes, the world has fucked me over. I'm going to fuck the world over as far as I can go. That, it, that is still a response, a logical response to whatever it is their interpretation of the world is. And so I think the best way that we can create more realistic situations and understandings with these sorts of people or these sorts of experiences is by understanding how people make decisions, how perspective shifts when trauma, trauma happens, and how experiences vary from person to person based on personal values and personality and beliefs and what that trauma is that eventually sets them off because all of these things are going to create a different response. So that was kind of all over the place and I'm sorry um, if it was confusing at all, but I'm looking forward to your thoughts and the comments on the subject. I'm sure that y'all are gonna say things that I'm gonna be like, you know what? I could have worded that so much better because you are absolutely right on this thing. So with that, with that said, thank you so much for watching. I hope there is some sort of takeaway beyond read more books about people whose experiences you're very interested in and then see if you can find how their logic works. Kind of, what is it? Reverse engineer. This is where we ended. Now, how did we get here? That's a, that's a pretty fun game to play. So, um, do that <laughs> and then try to just stick it into your story somehow because your characters will always make internal sense. Looking from the outside may not make sense at all, but it always is sensical from the internal side. Anyway, I'm ranting again. So thank you so much for watching. Have a great weekend. Looking forward to the comments. Don't die. Please also don't, don't like just destroy me. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trying to facilitate an interesting combo uh, with people who are way smarter than me. Yeah. Was that Wayland Cross in the trunk? Do you know, or is that something that's still being figured out? The person in the trunk was not Wayland Cross. Is he in trouble? We don't know who did it, but as the owner of the car, the longer he's missing, the worse it looks for him. Cross isn't a killer. For the last couple of years, the average number of murders in Baltimore has been over 300 and it's been going up. Mind you, that's only whatever the badges count as official murder, and believe me, there are people that don't count when they die. Wayland? If you're down here, tell me. I'm not talking to the badges, I just... I've been looking for you. They found a body in your trunk. Way. Why? Did you do that? To the left. Plain black letters read along the wall. You walked in the corridor. Once that ends, you chose the dark is on the right. My vision goes blurry, flickers black and black and black for longer intervals until I can't see anything at all. I'm not screaming anymore, but my voice echoes back to me. Where the hell am I? You're dead, Josephine. Even smart people do stupid shit sometimes, right? <laughs>